Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, Investigate Europe webinar on the state of play of European trends. I'm Maria Maggiore. I work for this consortium of journalists. We have just published a huge investigation on, on trains conducted in 14 countries. Uh, we try to understand why trains are um, clearly climate friends, but today only 6% of passengers and only 18% of freight use the trains. Um, they are responsible for this uh, failure. There are difficulties, there are obstacles. Um, there is probably a new renaissance uh, with the climate emergency. So we will speak about all that. Uh, I'm proud of a very good panel this afternoon. So let me introduce uh, um, Christian Schmidt. Uh, you are land director at the European Commission. Good afternoon. Um, and then um, I am sure uh, you will receive a lot of questions today, uh, for instance, by John Worth, train expert, a strong campaigner for night trains and many other things, John, uh, who is not in Budapest as somebody could think, <laughs> but is hidden somewhere uh, near a station because he was about to miss this uh, webinar because of train connections. Um, and then I welcome Pio Guido, buonasera, um, from the European Railway Agency, ERA. Uh, and finally, uh, Tom Buchholt, sorry for my pronunciation, from Flix Mobility, uh, which includes, of course, the very well-known uh, bus company Flixbus. And we are waiting for uh, Tobias Holle from the German branch of uh, Friday for Future. He, he is lost somewhere. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I have many questions, but uh, as I said before starting, I also encourage you to speak together. Uh, we, you can raise hands or just join, We um, jump in the conversation. And the same, um, you public from home, you can uh, send your questions here and the chat we have opened, uh, question and answers chat. So not the chat of Zoom, but this special chat. We will answer to you either in written, either I will try to pick up some questions um, during the debate. Um, but first, uh, because before starting, um, I propose to watch the short video teaser we always prepare to introduce our uh, investigations, uh, which is always done by our Greek uh, team. Very good. So let's have a look together. Let's see. Twenty twenty one was dubbed the European Year of Rail as part of the EU's efforts to tackle the climate crisis. To mark the moment, the Commission launched the Connecting Europe Express, a train that would crisscross twenty six countries and showcase the unifying force of rail. Unifying force? During its journey, the Connecting Europe Express had to change locomotives fifty five times. Investigate Europe's team of journalists from 14 countries took a ride on the continent's trains to investigate the state of Europe's railways. Paolo left Lisbon at sunrise and arrived in Madrid at night. He had to board four different trains that took 11 hours to cover 600 kilometers. Nico and Lorenzo approached the Brenner Tunnel. When completed in 2032, it will be the longest railway tunnel in the world. Yet to date, no one knows who, if anyone, will use it. Attila and Anna traveled from Budapest to Belgrade to Piraeus, a trade route snubbed for decades by the EU, yet now promoted and funded by Beijing. What did they uncover? Railways seem to be in a worse state than 20 years ago, despite four European Union rail packages. Many domestic networks have shrunk drastically, while international connections have also suffered a big blow. Night trains have almost disappeared. Cross-border online ticketing is often a bad joke. On both domestic and international routes, more than one in two trains is late. So, who killed the train? Was it the forced separation of railway infrastructure from train operations, a rule that exists only in Europe? Was it the privatization and supposed liberalization of the railways? Or, on the contrary, was it big players like SNCF and Deutsche Bahn who stifled competition through protectionism and double standards? 
was it national governments, who heavily subsidized aviation, car makers and motorways, while neglecting railways? In this whodunit, they are all culprits. And not the only ones. To find out who else has blood on their hands, read our investigations by media partners across Europe. Good, we are back. So it resumes a bit all the topics we have covered. I would start with climate because climate is the reason why train, we can tell between us has uh, come up uh, in the attention of people recently. I wanted to start with Tobias who is this young uh, activist, uh, closest friends of climate, but he's not there. So John, I will ask you to help me um, just remaining on climate for the moment, and then we will tackle, of course, all the other um, issues. We know that train um, um, is the cleanest way of transport, only 1% of CO2 instead of 71 for roads. So there is no issue on that, although probably Tom will say something on long distances. I mean, I let you tell that after. Um, so what is your experience at the same time? Because uh, um, we, we saw these activists going to Glasgow. They only all wanted to take the train, catch the train, but they had to change. I don't know how many times it was a nightmare for some of them. Can you tell us why we have to take the train today, remaining on this uh, angle of, of climate? Right, so what I say, I, what you say there, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, and indeed, that's been my motivation for being a regular railway passenger over all of these years has been the environmental reasons. Um, and there are two parts to that. Even trains uh, that uh, run currently on diesel, uh, so do um, emit CO2 emissions, there are potentially easier ways to um, turn that into electric power through either electrifying the lines or, or, or battery power or even hydrogen. So the environmental basis for rail travel is an extremely solid one. Uh, and as well, if you make sure that the electricity that the trains use is generated in a green manner, then that's all uh, the better. The difficulty that all of those climate activists suffered, however, is the moment you start to cross a border on European trains, trying to actually work out first which trains even run, and then second, even how to book tickets for them, is a very difficult task because quite often you can't book a through ticket if it crosses into two or three countries. And that therefore means that you have to buy multiple tickets, which means if the first train gets delayed, you don't necessarily have the rights to take the second or the third train. Now, let's put all of that into context, however, right? There've been videos circulating on, on Twitter and on Facebook of activists for Norway going to Glasgow by train. Most people are not going to go from Oslo to Glasgow by train in the future we need to focus on what we can achieve right now and so those are journeys which have a daytime trip time of under six hours by train yeah so those are things like frankfurt to brussels um or um uh, paris to marseille trips like that you get more of those people onto daytime trains for longer journeys something like cologne or what cologne to warsaw you could replace that with a night train what we are not going to see in the short term is a large percentage of people going from Oslo to Glasgow going by train. It's simply too complicated, too long and too slow. But there are big climate advantages to be had, uh, even in those kind of easy wins which railways could achieve on many of the shorter routes. Tom uh, Butchhold, I, I would like to enlarge because you, uh, mm -hmm. with Flixbus, you found another way to, um, to link um, very long distances by bus and people, I would say, especially young people, but you will tell me not only are liking it, uh, although it still pollutes much more than, than the train. Um, do you think the future is by bus or by train? Thanks, Maria, first of all, for the invitation and um, second of all, for the question. Um, well, first of all, I think we have to make a very important distinction because it is not road against rail, but the distinction has to be sustainable collective transport, which is bus and rail, I will explain it in a second, against more polluting means of transport, meaning both individual mobility with cars or air travel. Um, there are actually several studies, for example, in Germany by the Federal Environmental Agency, um, so federal institution, that prove that buses, when it comes to CO2 emissions or external costs, 
are actually at the same level with long distance trains. Um, so buses and trains are complementary and both are equally needed um, to offer an attractive choice for passengers. There are rural regions, for example, where it must not necessarily make sense to send a train every hour, but where an offer of a combination between bus and train would make much more sense and does make much more sense, as we can see, with more than 60 million people traveling with our buses and trains in 2019. Um, so especially cross-border, where we see that the infrastructure has been neglected, where we have different standards um, when it comes to electricity, safety standards, sometimes really artificial standards uh, in member states that are hindering the emergence of new train services. There we can see that the long distance buses are successful, but I don't want to exclude, on the contrary, I really want to advocate that in the future, we want to cross borders with trains as well. And it must be in the future um, as easy to cross borders with trains as we do currently with our buses. I just stop for a moment because I see that uh, people are writing a lot in the main chat as we have created this Q and A um, chat. Now, to be honest, I don't know uh, what is the difference, but I've been asked to to ask you to split to the other one. Um, also, because this chat is arriving on my screen and I can't see you very well, but this is not so important. Um, thank you, Tom. Always remaining on climate, uh, Christian Schmidt. I, I remember so you are um, director of the European Commission, and you are not director for trains, but you are director for land, which means which includes also road and ship. This is probably also the signal that uh, until now trains did not have all this attention, if I may, uh, because it was the same also 20 years ago when, uh, when I, I started uh, this job. Um, remaining on climate, um, so Tom from Flix Mobility just said that the future is a mixture of, of both, especially for these difficult uh, cross-border connections. John is, uh, okay, he says better to uh, invest on uh, uh, urgent things and we can uh, uh, encourage the less than six hour connections, okay? Um, we calculate as Investigate Europe that uh, there are more or less 5,000 kilometers which still go by diesel because we have to remember that the train is nice and good if it's clean, but if it still goes by diesel and uh, if it's electrified, but then the electricity is not renewable, then it's just um, a lot of blah, blah, as somebody else said. Um, so do you still think is worth to invest in this train infrastructure, which is missing? Um, and, um, and does it fit with your Green Deal uh, goals? Um, although this demands a lot of effort by member states, which should perhaps be encouraged, also perhaps not counting it in their public uh, deficit, no? Uh, so taking it out from the stability pact. Um, what is your assessment about what remains to be done in terms of infrastructure? Thanks a lot, Maria, and let me start by congratulating Investigate Europe for its uh, investigation. You are putting a spotlight uh, and many important messages. Um, I would tend to agree to with a lot of your findings, some less so, but you asked me a question, so I will, I will answer that. Um, first of all, I agree with, with Tom. Um, the target is to decarbonize transport, and transport is one of the sectors where emissions are still growing. Um, and therefore, we need to look at all modes. Uh, and in some cases, indeed, clean buses um, can be the, uh, the best choice where the network uh, for rail is not so dense. But rail, of course, also has to um, give its contribution. It is, for the moment, the cleanest land transport mode. And therefore, we, we, we talk about shifting to rail because, for the moment, rail is the cleanest. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think we are doing pretty well uh, in terms of rail being green. 55% uh, of the ne network is electrified, but but you have to look at the, the percentage of the traffic. 80% of the traffic uh, is uh, on electric uh, lines, um, on even 90% of the core network. And I'm not sure that 100% is the target because um, it may not be economical on things like uh, small rural lines or you know, production sites or port areas uh, to have um, uh, electrical lines installed. There, perhaps you want hydrogen or battery-driven tra trains. 
But um, I think rail is perfectly on track to be totally zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which is our target. So yes, I, th I think we, we will manage that. The investments um, are there, um, certainly in the recovery and resilience facility, the member states have, have put electrification as one of the important objectives. So um, I, I, I don't think that's uh, the issue of whether rail is going to be green enough. It is more, is the electricity produced green enough that is being used on the trains? And is rail efficient enough to take um, a stronger place in European land transport? And let me finish by saying Glasgow by train, um, no problem. I did it uh, to go to the COP, took eight hours from Brussels to London, one change in London. We roll through the beautiful countryside of the Lakes District. I can only recommend it, do it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, but I think Tobias had another experience probably coming from Germany, but uh, I, I prefer to let him say that if you join us. Um, Let's now enter in the trains world. Once we agree that trains, of course, are clean and uh, and uh, would be the best solution if it could be possible to use only the train. Um, when I arrived to, in Brussels, so 20 years ago, I was a very young journalist. Um, I remember the mantra in Brussels was always, there was no climate emergency at that time. It was uh, from road to rail, from road to rail. It was repeated all the time. And at the same time, the commissioner was launching um, the liberalization, first packages, second package, and, um, and uh, the corridors. And there was a lot of optimists, which remained for, for, for more than 10 years, I would say, that this could be possible. And today we discovered that so little people, so a few people, 6% use the train. So um, something got wrong. And uh, also the corridors are not finished. Um, they are delayed. We have been in the Brenner, as you, Christian, you read our um, investigation. We have been there, and now they, it should have been finished in 2016, and it would be now finished in 2032 uh, with more money. I mean, we know that there are problems, but not only that. Uh, John mentioned that it's a nightmare when you want to, to buy a ticket uh, crossing uh, countries. Companies very often don't talk each other, and this will not change with the new regulation, which has been uh, approved, because this is not mandatory. So there are still a lot of weaknesses. And just to finish my, let's say, introduction, just to let's speak about the problems, not only congratulate ourselves of uh, what is good. Um, you launched this very nice, I have to say, um, campaign with the Connect Europe Express, this train, we, which we followed from Lisbon, it arrived to Paris uh, uh, in October, and um, it had to change 55 locomotives to cross 26 countries. So this shows how complicated still remains this network. And just to finish, the Court of Auditor says that it is not a network, but a patchwork of systems. So perhaps the, the first person who can help us with that is Pio Guido, hello, uh, because you had, and your yeah. colleagues as well, this very complicated task uh, since 2004, if I'm not wrong, to reduce the technicalities in Europe there were more than 14,000, and now you arrived only to 800, which is still a lot, we think, 800. Um, but you also wrote in your annual report that in the last decade, very little has been made in concerning interoperability, very little progress. So um, what is the situation, Pio, of, um, of interoperability of trains in Europe? Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me and good afternoon to all. Uh, yes, I work for a small agency. We are 160 people, more or less, and we have the not very glamorous task um, uh, to deal with the effort to harmonize all the technical um, specifications that we have um, in Europe, in the different countries that uh, sometimes creating the problem at the borders that were mentioned before. I think that railways have been developing nearly for, you know, nearly 200 years now and uh, uh, they've been uh, at the beginning at the forefront of what was the, the industrial revolution at the time and they were uh, i can say uh, leading edge technology that that required a lot of investment for which we had to do 
as mentioned before, a, a lot of very costly uh, fixed uh, infrastructure investment like uh, the Brenner Tunnel you were mentioning and the others that are still there. So the pace of change for railways is clearly on a, on a long time. I mean, infrastructure, when we talk about uh, bridges, tunnels, et cetera, and you put them in place for serving a specific route, you cannot change tomorrow if the traffic pattern uh, is more uh, attractive between a, another pair of cities. So I think that rail, given this possibility to be very efficient because they have uh, wheel uh, which are made of steel on, on rails, which are made of steel, the, the coefficient, uh, I mean, is, is, is very low. So it clear the energy efficiency is very high, but on the other end, they cannot follow so quickly the evolutions that we have in other sectors in terms of innovation and, and change. Today, we have rails that uh, more or less have the same uh, gauge, as we say, the same distance between the tracks in most of Europe, except, for example, in, in some areas. And uh, the train uh, connecting Europe Express started from the Berlian countries, where we have a slight different uh, gauge. Uh, we have different uh, standards for the electrification that was mentioned is um, covering most of the core network, but still we have at least four different voltages that we use today in Europe and uh, smaller variation in terms of the geometry of these uh, wires overhead that uh, provide the uh, power supply to the pantograph of the, the locomotives. And because we are getting a better, more safe, more, uh, I can say, digital way of controlling the trains, uh, there was a lot of development in terms of the safety systems that are on board the trains. So today, in most uh, advanced system, we have computers on board the trains that can um, receive information from the track side so that they can check and control if the train is really traveling at the speed that is supposed to travel, is not exceeding it, is not uh, exceeding the distance at which it's supposed to go. Uh, and those systems were a development that started say, in the last decades or, or of the last century or the last millennium, let's say. And they were still done uh, in a time where there was no, no railway package and uh, integrated railways in, uh, within the boundaries of member states. And they were developed mostly for the domestic uh, traffic with domestic um, industries with, with local champions. And as I mentioned, those systems are still in place today. They ensure the safety of the, the trains running in the different countries, but uh, they contribute to this fragmentation that we have in Europe in terms of electrification, in terms of gauge sometimes, in terms but of- Can the... I cut you just a little bit? I start being a bit Italian now. Sorry, because, okay, for people who don't, know very well how it works and you say it's uh, comprehensible because it's concerned safety that we have these different systems but this does not happen with the flights with the flights we manage to have one safety I, I guess I'm not an expert but at least a flight can travel from a country to an hour another one with without changing the uh, driver because this is the case with the train, they need to speak the language of the country where they arrive, level minimum B1, which seems to be back in the middle age, I have to say. Um, and, um, and the safety measures as well, you work at, and, uh, and you, now I'll put you in the bubble, let's say you, you invested a lot on a common signalization system. We call it in this difficult acronym, which is EFMS. EFMS. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think uh, the commission spent almost 4 billion euros for, for the research. So it was a huge work to arrive to a system which could be applied in Germany, in France, in the biggest market. Um, and, and now you made it uh, mandatory uh, in the fourth package by 2030 for the corridors and 2050 men in all EU trains. Uh, but the progress are so little. Uh, what's happened, me, Pio? And then I will ask also Christian to ask me to tell me politically what is possible to be done about that. 
Yeah, I mean, EATMS is uh, maybe the most uh, visible, I can say, element of the difficulties, but also the progressive success that we're having with uh, with this. You, you're right. I mean, according to the, the uh, TNT regulation, by 2030, all the, um, the the core network should be equipped with ETCS EATMS with this uh, system. And in addition, should also allow trains, freight trains uh, that uh, can run up to 740 meters of length, which is not something that, that we have, that we can travel with the 22.5 tons per axle. I mean, the 10 uh, regulation is not only about ETCS, but definitely by 2030, about 50,000 kilometers should be installed and, and uh, um, enabled to run trains with ETCS. And today uh, we are at about 6,000 kilometers. So I, I think- countries are not investing a lot in ERTMS as you, you, you say in your reports? Yes, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, there are systems already in place today and in different countries, they come from different uh, backgrounds. For example, we have Denmark and maybe I defer to, to Christian, but they have decided because of the, the, the age of the current system that they had in place that the best move was to uh, install ETCS all over the network in Denmark. And of course, it's not something that you do overnight. So I think that uh, they are well advanced uh, there. There are other countries like Italy. I, I come from Italy. We opened the first high-speed line uh, in the Roma Napoli in 2004, and it was in service from day one with ETCS. There is no other fallback system. There is no parachute, if you want. And now all the high-speed lines in Italy, or for example, all the high-speed lines in, in Spain, are running daily with, with EDCS. So countries are investing into that. There is a disparity and there are difference because of the different uh, age and performance of the national system that, that they have in place. And the 2030 target, it's an ambitious one. And maybe I leave the commission to talk about that. But I think that uh, we see that, that we can make it if we really, I can say, we, we work together on that. I, I will just mention one additional element is not only the number of kilometers that we have with ETCS, it's also to make sure that this system is really implemented following the rules. You mentioned the, uh, the number of rules that the agency is dealing with. What we're doing is trying to reduce the national rules to make sure that all countries implement the harmonized rules. And I mean, it's not a sexy work. It's a lot of, I can say, detailed, uh, heavy discussion on, on, on technical details. We are seeing some progress, but um, I think that uh, the target is ambitious. We have the, the, the means in place to do that, but I, I think that uh, as an agency, we would like to, to um, I can say, get a little bit more um, teeth or, or I can say possibility to, to be more uh, aggressive in the positive sense vis-a-vis -vis member states and other national safety authorities when we find that some of those rules should not be applied any longer. We, we asked that directly to Christian Schmidt. Do you think uh, through the ERI who now has the teeth in the fourth packages, it said that, that they can uh, complain, attack, let's say a country. Do you think this should be done? Do you think the deadline of 2050 is still uh, um realistic or because we have to remind people outside that uh, installing the rtms in a locomotive costs around 250,000 euros mm. so it's a lot of money or um, somebody told us that as these concerns especially cross border connection shouldn't that be limited to cross border connections and not all also regional uh, national train so rtms is still a priority and can be realized or it's it's just an utopia you know that as many times yeah, the commission thanks, does. thanks maria i would you know compare this a little bit to the vaccination i mean i should we only vaccinate people who are crossing borders and going outside their house no we need um and there's a bit of a first mover disadvantage in in ertms um those who go first face these high costs and they are asking why should we etc cetera, etc cetera. so the only solution to that is strict deadlines um, and we will be setting more uh, tight obligations in the next 10t guidelines on this but um, on track side deployment of ERTMS we are on track uh, 80 percent by 2040 will be met uh, but yes uh, uh, to answer your question the European Railway Agency needs resources 
it has a, a strong mandate under uh, the fourth railway package. Infringement procedures based on ERA findings can be, can be launched, um, and we won't hesitate uh, to do that. I think it's very important, and your investigation shows that as well, we cannot go on with railway nationalism, I would call it, fragmentation, uh, Pio called it. Um, we need to move away from a sort of loose coordination approach to true harmonization. Um, only then will we bring down the costs for operators. You mentioned the Connecting Europe Express. Um, it wasn't a showcase uh, to show the unifying power. It was the, I would say almost, well, it was to you know sh show uh, the, um, uh, the positive message that in the middle of a pandemic, we can still uh, go across Europe in, in a train, but it solved nothing. It solved nothing and it sh shone a spotlight on these issues that you have just uh, mentioned um, and mobilized a lot of political momentum and, and, and attention to the issues of interoperability that we are talking about uh, now. And I would, I would finish by add, adding, this isn't just about making uh, it affordable and practical to, to cross borders for the, for the operators, the, the new uh, services that are after all coming on stream. It's also a, a very strong European interest for the railway supply industry um, that we move away from this fragmentation, that we achieve economies of scale. We call ourselves a global power in rail. We won't be in the future if we keep producing uh, units and locomotives for dedicated small fragmented markets. We will not um, yes. achieve economies of, of scale. So uh, yes, uh, we are dealing with obsolete rules. The European Railway uh, um, Agency has the power to tear those national borders down. It needs a bit more resources to do so. Um, I think uh, Pio would agree with that. He called it a small and not so glamorous agency. It is a glamorous agency, but I, I wish it was bigger. Um, so it does have the powers in on paper. Uh, it does have uh, the mandate uh, to do what we are talking about. Um, and it is happening, but it's not happening fast enough. We all agree with that. Thank you, Christian. I would like to give the floor to, to, to John now, but I'm sorry because I can't avoid myself to ask you a question on what you just said before, because you are pointing um, a very sensitive issue, which is the, um, some sources call it the collusion between the industry and uh, some companies. And we experienced in our research today that this is still uh, happening. I can't, of course, call it really collusion, but um, let's say um, the not um, <laughs> opening of some companies, which create systems that uh, can only be uh, used by the local national company and not by foreign competitors. Uh, this happened to Renfe, the Spanish public company, who is trying to get into the French market. And, uh, and it, it, there, there are problems created by the French industry, Alstom, who, who is producing things for them. And so it's, it's, it's a mess. And they wrote to you, uh, to the commission. They are now really openly speaking about that. So it becomes a problem for, for them. Um, is the commission also playing its role of, uh, of uh, Guardian monitoring that? I mean, there is ERI, but you can also attack SNCF, uh, um, the infrastructure authority. I mean, you, you can. Are you going to do uh, that? Let me, let me assure you, we are playing our role as guardian of the treaty. Collusion is a word from uh, competition law, and it refers to price fixing and cartels. And in, if any of that is happening, uh, it's illegal and will be dealt with. Um, I think the issue that you are referring to here is, again, the fragmentation of the national markets and the vested interest of the historical players, the legacy players, who, of course, are defending their markets. This is the the... the the, the natural behavior of, of companies to defend their market shares. Our job as regulators and the jobs of the new entrants and com competitors is to challenge those established positions. And um, you refer uh, and keep referring to what happened 20 years ago and nothing has happened. Don't forget the fourth railway package and the opening up of the European markets only just um, uh, entered into force in the middle of a pandemic with, where some of the new operators wanting to invest we're facing, I would say, a lot of headwinds, but there are signs of spring. There are good news. You refer to Italy and to Spain. When in Italy, uh, uh, because of competition from new entrants, uh, the number of passengers have 
quadrupled in a decade, 1 million in 2008, 3.6 million in 2018. And if you promise not to tell anyone not on this webinar, probably Alitalia uh, uh, suffered from the efficiency of new competition on rail um, and took over the domestic market from, from aviation in Italy. In Spain, if you look at uh, uh, the entry there from SNCF, uh, we go and also a new uh, local uh, Spanish competitor. It is driving ridership up and it's reducing the prices and more revenues for the uh, infrastructure manager. So, so competition is working. It's simply not yet working enough in all areas. And you know, going from France into Spain is fine. Now we want to see Spain go into France. Italian companies going into uh, uh, France as well. And there are reasons we can talk about why this is not happening yet, but do not draw the, the conclusion that um, unbundling isn't working, that competition isn't working. It is the opposite. It is working. It's not working fast enough. And there are obstacles that we need to tear down uh, together. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, John Worth, can you help me a little bit more? Who, who are the responsible of this uh, fragmentation of the railway network, patchwork, let's say? The kind of ele the, the elephant in the room is the national railway companies. And those are the very same national railway companies that form a trade association in Brussels called Community of European Railways. And which trade association was it that actually organized the very same Connecting Europe Express that Christian Schmidt has been talking about? That would be the Community of European Railways, the very state incumbents, which are the root of the problem. You did not need 55 different locomotives for the Connecting Europe Express. You probably could have done it with five. You could have run it with a Siemens Vectron locomotive, which operates freight Europe-wide. Why did you run 55 different locomotives? Because every national railway company wanted its locomotive. Yeah, it was not only an interoperability issue. That's it was true, and there was nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there was the national railway companies behaving badly towards each other. I was on that Connecting Europe Express. The Polish Railways PKP put their shiny brand new built in 2020 locomotive on the front of the Connecting Europe Express, and it wasn't allowed to cross the last few kilometers into Czech Republic, where it would be technologically compatible because the railway company had not actually got it cleared to drive to Bohemian on the Czech side. That's nothing the EU can fix. That's bad behavior by the incumbent railway companies. And Christian Schmidt mentioned France and Spain. The biggest scandal in European railways is the high-speed railway line connecting Figueras in Spain with Perpignan in France. That high-speed railway line cost more than 1 billion euros to construct with, a, with, as far as I understand it, 200 million euros of EU subsidy for the line. And it has two trains high speed each way each day. It is absolutely scandalous. And ideally, we have competition that works in Spain or potentially in Italy. But when SNCF sent its trains to Spain, it took the French signaling out of them so it couldn't operate them on cross-border routes. So I take what Christian Schmidt says about, about liberalization working potentially in national markets, but cross-border, it does not work so far. And there are major, major difficulties and headaches, and particularly with regard to the national mentality. And there is a difficulty as well, and this is where I would expect and hope for more activity and more determination from the European Commission, is to have a systematic analysis of exactly what the problems are on different cross-border railway routes. So let's take it, if Christian will want to go and visit Pio Guido at the, Europe, at the European Railways Agency, he might want to take, for example, a cross-border route between Mons and Valenciennes, where the, European, where the European Railways Agency is located. But the track doesn't exist. There are two kilometers of track missing on that cross-border connection. So if you look at, for example, Belgium to France cross-border connections, there are loads of places where the track is missing. You could actually basically make relatively cheap quick investments in infrastructure that would improve the situation. The second problem is like the one between Figueras and Barcelona, where the track exists, but trains don't run, which is also comparatively ridiculous, right? And the third is when tracks exist and trains run, but you can't very easily book them, right? Now that might sound ridiculous. You're running a train and you can't get a ticket for it, but that's how ridiculous European railways are. I'll just conclude. If I book a ticket from Berlin to Strasbourg, yeah, 
Deutsche Bahn's website will give me a ticket price of 105 euros, cheapest price, right? If I'm on the cross-border regional train for the past few kilometers. If I book instead to the final station before the border, Kiel, and then book Kiel to Strasbourg, it costs me 40 euros, right? Now, I know that trick because I'm a railway nerd, right? These are the types of problems, right? The line to the city of the European Railways Agency, the cross-border train to the city that hosts the European Parliament, yeah? at the very least, the European Commission could potentially be doing a bit more in the way of naming and shaming of the member states, pointing out where these problems exist. Christian, I am obliged to give you the floor. Uh, yeah, you I'm grateful to... for that. Um, and uh, first of all, I said competition is working. But I certainly did not say that competition and opening up for uh, uh, market integration in itself is enough. It's not. Um, and that's the very reason the Commission is coming forward next month with its action plan on cross-border long-distance passenger rail, because it will address all those, I would say, technical, but they are also, of course, commercial barriers to entry and to do exactly what John is saying exploit the cross-border market, which, um, and that's going to be in our first paragraph of the action plan, the percentage is too low. Not so what will be plan. your concrete proposals in this so action will, plan? We are all waiting for that. Yeah, well, great. I can give you the 10 points, but the college decides next week. Huh? Uh, sorry, next <laughs> month. Huh? But interoperability is one thing. Infrastructure gaps is another thing. The lack of rolling stock is a third thing. The management of capacity and the lack of European thinking in the way that capacity is allocated, which I would say translates maybe a domestic national frame of mind, or you could say protectionism um, um, is another interpretation of it. Um, uh, the EIB will be associated with a market offer um, on rolling stock, something I know is dear to John's heart. Um, and. Uh, 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 all these issues are technical issues, uh, perhaps, but they are the reason why the integration of the single European railway area, which we have on paper, hasn't materialized in reality. So there is certainly work to be done. Um, and, and if I can just issue the appeal um, to everyone to lower the national defense mechanisms and accept that by allowing uh, this competition to take place across borders, the overall pie uh, of rail will grow and everybody will, will benefit. This is the exact same uh, uh, reasoning that the Commission has been right about in all different areas of the economy. And so far, it hasn't happened in one of the oldest sectors uh, in the European economy because it's happened everywhere else and it has worked and has driven down prices and it hasn't yet happened in rail and it must happen immediately. Tom Buchholz, I would like to involve you in this uh, discussion. Um, um, fixed mobility has also started running trains, uh, although your big success is with buses. And, uh, and uh, so you are experiencing how difficult it is to penetrate a national market. C can you give us example on how difficult it is uh, in Germany, you are in Sweden, mm -hmm. what are the differences? And then we can also introduce these other problem, big problem, which is the access fees, which are so different from a state to another one. If you can also explain, what is it? Definitely. These are all of them are very relevant points, um, actually. So um, we started our first fixed train in Germany in 2018, um, and we started in Sweden um, as well this year. Um, and there is a huge difference between the German system, where we still have a vertically integrated incumbent state-owned to Sweden, where we have a separated infrastructure manager from operations. So let me give you an example. If we apply for tracks in Germany, so if you want to run with our train um, between Berlin and Stuttgart, so between uh, Northeastern and Southern Germany, then we have to ask the infrastructure manager, which belongs to Deutsche Bahn, for access to these tracks. This happens by paper. So there is no online tool for it or um, any digital solution. No, our network planners have to take a software, then they have to look for possible paths, then they have to print it, and then they have to send it to Deutsche Bahn. And Deutsche Bahn is then taking its time, one, two, three months, is checking whether these paths are available or not. And after some time, one, two months, they come back and tell us, sorry, this path is not available, full stop. 
there's no alternative, there's nothing, then our infrastructure uh, planners have to go back again and have to redraft the entire plan. It's an incredibly long process. And you have a high level of insecurity because this happens year by year by year. So you don't know as a private operator such as we are, whether you will have the same tracks the next year. Then you have Sweden, which is the exact, like the extreme and exact opposite of Germany. Here you have an independent infrastructure manager that treats you as a client, as a railway undertaking that actually wants more services on rail and where you have a digital solution, where the entire process takes two or three weeks. You have a website where you see which path is available, where are possible conflicts, with whom do I have to talk if there is a conflict to find a solution together, and you just resolve the issues way earlier, you have more security, you know that you can run your services, and that's why you can see in Sweden there are several operators, both private and state-owned, competing against each, uh, against each other. You have lower prices uh, for the tickets, and you have more passengers traveling in trains, and more importantly, less people traveling in cars. And just one addition to that, there's also another factor. You mentioned it, the track access charges. In Sweden, we pay for our trains the direct costs. So we only pay the costs that incur when we run with our trains on the track. So we pay approximately one euro 50 per kilometer in Sweden. In Germany, we pay on average seven to eight euros per kilometer. The tracks are the same. The quality of the infrastructure is not better in Germany overall but we pay much more because there's a charge added on top because the infrastructure manager, part of the integrated company has to make a profit, which is insane. So there are huge differences. And that's why from our perspective, it is not understandable why integrated companies do still exist and why they still can cause these extremely high inefficiencies. The infrastructure is not well used. The prices are artificially high and it's extremely difficult to enter the market. So, Mr. Smith, could you answer to, to that? Will the Commission um, try to put order in this, uh, I would say, jungle of uh, access fees, where the, the, the access to, to the market, single market, is so different? Mm. And, uh, and also, there is no transparency in the prices. So this is what we have also witnessed is, uh, um, talking with sources. Uh, I would say, especially in the big uh, countries. Uh, are you thinking of, um, of trying to harmonize that or at least make them more transparent? Uh, thank you, Maria, but uh, please let the record show that what Tom just said, uh, and I agree with him entirely, was a strong advocacy for the unbundling of the fourth railway package, right? Trafikwerket in Sweden, which I visited on this wonderful Connecting Europe Express, um, is exactly that. It is an independent infrastructure manager offering uh, uh, um, uh, affordable track access for all the competitors and competition is working, driving prices up, um, or sorry, prices down and ridership uh, uh, up. Um, I also agree entirely with Tom, um, this path allocation mechanism we have in Europe for the moment is manual, it's annual, and it's uh, a legacy of the past we have to go digital. Uh, it has to be path allocation by the click of a, of a mouse. Uh, the sector is working on it. Um, and if they sort it out, we will give it legislative um, enforcement um, uh, next, uh, next year. Um, it's called the timetable redesign process. Um, and it's absolutely crucial to optimize the use uh, of tracks as they are today. Coming to the track access charges, basically you have two models in Europe. Um, and that explains the big differences that you see. You have countries, Sweden is one, where investments have been made in railways um, and where uh, um, uh, uh, tracks are for free, uh, more or less, right? And there you can uh, run night trains and you can compete, etc. Then you have um, uh, other countries where you don't have so many public funding going into the railways, uh, and uh, um, you don't want to subsidize with uh, public service obligations, there you charge a fee. You charge a fee, and uh, that's where you recuperate uh, the cost of the, of the network and uh, the cost of maintenance. Now, I can, as an economist, understand both those uh, different models because you know, somebody's got to pay at the end of the day. But I can also see that the, the difference of model um, and the countries that have high track access charges and do not give, for instance, priorities to the cross-border trains we all want to see, 
they are an impediment to uh, the growth of uh, cross-border passenger rail that we want to, to see. So there are, there are two solutions that we will advocate, including in our action plan, more investment, more public investment into rail. And a lot of, uh, of it is coming from the recovery and resilience facility uh, and the EU's uh, um, post-COVID uh, COVID pandemic uh, recovery plan. Um, and the other is to lower track access charges where possible to only charge direct costs and certainly not to discriminate against competition from cross-border uh, connections. It's already possible under EU legislation, um, but it's not happening uh, enough. Um, and we would like to see uh, uh, member states not uh, charge uh, levels that simply are, are an impediment uh, to, uh, to this. So, um, and, and I would say there is a little bit of static thinking in also what I explained. If you reduce the track access charges and you get more trains to run overall, again, you are growing the pie of the market. You are growing the volume of traffic. And your own country, Maria, um, has been the best example of this in Europe because Italy has introduced track access charges that are differentiated to uh, the level of saturation on the network. So if you want to go from Milano, Centrale to Roma Termini, those are saturated and you will pay a high price for track access. But if you want to go a little bit beyond that, outside that uh, very saturated part of the network, the price is a lot lower. That's the way smart charging of European railways should be done. And it's possible under EU legislation, but we will encourage that it's done much more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned my country. Uh, I know it's black and white because uh, we, we are very good for high speed, although it costs a lot, a lot. And uh, we have a situation in the south of Italy. So um, it, it's, it's very polarized, the debate in Italy about trains. Uh, but uh, let's go beyond. And um, in fact, um, I would like to, to pick up I am really sorry that I am not um, answering to all these Q and A questions I'm reading because um, it would take another debate. Um, but I pick up one question because it will uh, help us to, I mean, go on in the discussion. And this is um, comes from one of our sources. You probably met already um, some of you, uh, Benedict Weibel, who was the former head of Swiss Railways and uh, is now still in the market. And he said that, uh, I mean, he's criticizing the failure of EU rail policies. And he said that the big mistake is the split of uh, the companies in different parts, like infrastructure and other parts, um, which is not working. And why I pick at that? Because we know that this is now a hot debate in uh, for the creation of the new government in Germany, where, some parts, including the Greens, uh, I have to say we were surprised about that, uh, are supporting that, uh, I guess, to also break the, 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 the power of, ah, Tobias is there. Ah, oh, Tobias, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I, I will give you the floor in, in, in two minutes, just a moment. Um, and so perhaps it could be a way to break the, the power of, of the giant Deutsche Bahn, which remained still uh, um, so powerful I, as it was 20 years ago. Um, but in many other countries, um, this has been done, not everywhere, to, to really separate infrastructure and operation. I mentioned some uh, Troika countries, for instance, we wrote it in our investigation in Portugal, in Greece, this has been really done. And the situation is not uh, really good. They don't speak each other very often, these two companies. So um, perhaps Pio first, if you can help us in understanding that uh, from an infrastructure point of view, have you experienced uh, some difficulties when, um, when the, the company uh, belong to two different actors, let's say? Uh, and then, uh, of course, I asked the political side <laughs> about that. <laughs> you know, of course, we don't deal with the uh, economy and we don't do this, this part of the regulation. So I would leave maybe this consideration to the Commission or the other, the other partners. Maybe uh, on the more technical side, uh, two things. 
I just remind that uh, we were discussing about EATMS and the slow progress that we have. Just um, it, it was an idea, a child of the integrated railways, because it started in the end of last century, as I mentioned, before railway packages, before even the first um, directive on the separation of the account between infra manager and uh, the taking. So if you take it from an engineering point of view, sometimes you think that you know it's easier if the same company is managing the, the trains and is managing the track side, then everything should work because you have the same engineering company or the same pool of engineers that design the two parts of the system and magically it worked. Honestly, I must say, it's not always true. I mean, we have a lot of legacy systems that were developed in this fashion with integrated companies. And sometimes the, the engineering documentation and uh, you know the documents that will allow you, for example, to find other suppliers to produce the same uh, products that, that you need are not so well maintained because there was this, I can say, integrated way of working, sometimes integrated also with your national suppliers and then you didn't pay so much attention to formalize all the requirements and, and i think that we are paying a little bit this price so i'm not talking about the like the economic uh, uh, effect of that but uh, from a pure engineering point of view i would say that um, i don't think that's uh, what um, that the Swiss railways uh, are, are today still advocating in the frame of ETCS to have one single authority that deals with all the specifications. Uh, it's a right solution. I think we need more transparency. Open source also for specification is the way to go. And, and we need to put in the open uh, what is necessary to, to have a better algorithm. But um, I will stop there. Christian Smith, are you on the same line? Because uh, even uh, some former commission um, important representative, I spoke with, uh, for instance, Karel Bink. Uh, you know, he was the first EFTMS coordinator. He, at the end of this interview, said, uh, I think if the commission um, would, uh, would propose again uh, that, I mean, there was an historical reason why this uh, separation was asked at the beginning uh, 20 years ago was to break monopolies. But he said, um, I think they would act different in a different way. Um, do you share this opinion or you think uh, infrastructure and operator must remain separated? I, I don't share that opinion, and, I, and neither do you, I think. Your own investigation shows that uh, you, you find national protectionism to be a problem. Now, if you find that to be a problem, how would you like to maintain virtually integrated monopolies, um, uh, which is what we are, what, what we are talking about? Um, now, like in other network uh, industries across Europe, unbundling these vertically integrated monopolies is the only way that you can um, um, stimulate competition across uh, the borders. And I think you heard from Tom and others, the Swedish example again, but there are others of, of, of perfect uh, separation and how that drives um, uh, competition. Uh, so this was achieved uh, partially, uh, full unbundling with the fourth railway package. Um, and uh, of course, uh, what is uh, still the model in Germany is, is possible uh, to keep a virtual integration, provided that you have clear firewalls within uh, the companies to avoid conflict of interest. And to finish on Switzerland, yes, Switzerland has a fully integrated model. For that reason, it is an island protected from uh, competition from any of its neighbors, um, which survives in splendid isolation. Um, so I don't think uh, this is a model. It is a model within Switzerland because uh, uh, Switzerland is investing a lot in its own um, 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 railway system. And for that, Switzerland is a model. We should all invest as much as Switzerland is doing if we could. Uh, but it's certainly not a model for integrated cross-border rail um, and for access to uh, new services that can can only enter when there is competition. So John Worth, what do you think about this separation? Um, are you following this debate a little bit? And uh, uh, the Swiss model is not a model uh, we have to follow because trains uh, run quite uh, well in Switzerland, at least from I find it really view. frustrating, this argument. Um, you get what you pay for. Um, the Swiss have one of the highest levels of public subsidies for their railways uh, in, in a European comparison. They invest very heavily in the quality of the network. 
which is a country which has a partial separation, has some competition on its lines and a very good railway, Austria, yeah? Again, high levels of public investment in the railway. Um, if you look at Swiss performance on rail freight in Switzerland, yeah? it's not as good as it is internationally, and Swiss rail freight is actually comparatively liberal if it's crossing cross-border. So ultimately, there's this kind of question is, is this correlation or causation here? As far as I see it, how good your railway is depends on how much public investment you can put into the hard infrastructure. And Switzerland is really good at that. And so therefore, I, I, I always dislike this argument, particularly in Germany, where I'm based, where all the Germans go, oh, look at how great it is in Switzerland. To which my response is, well, are you willing to actually subsidize your railway in Germany to the same extent as the Swiss do? The Germans probably aren't. And that's probably a better explanation for the problems than whether it's integrated or not. Thank you. I see a hand raised by Tom. Tom, do you want to jump in this uh, particular issue? Infrastructure yes, operation? Yes, yes. One more thing to add with Switzerland. Um, I mean, the question here is also, for whom do you want to provide the system? And do you want to offer rail services for everyone? Because then it has to be affordable, which is not the case in Switzerland, which we can see with our bus services, which are actually um, very highly used from and to Switzerland, because A, private operators in long distance passenger transport cannot enter Switzerland without SBB allowing them to enter. And B, because the, uh, the ticket prices to Switzerland and within Switzerland are very, very high. So um, you can keep the vertically integrated company, but then you will lack a lot of passengers, the ones that cannot afford the ticket, uh, because you will have just one unified product. And even though subsidized will still be more expensive than a product where you have a choice between a low cost product and a higher quality product, which is then uh, differentiated, in, uh, differentiated in price. Interesting. We should make another debate just on that, I think. Tobias, I can welcome you now. What's happened? Are you okay? <laughs> yes, I'm okay. Um, I think the issue was um, that I was in Glasgow uh, when I put in the appointment or um, the webinar and my calendar didn't change it, change the time. So um, I'm now here in Glasgow time, but actually uh, Glasgow time is um, not in Germany, okay. so it, yeah, that, I understand. that's the issue, I think. Okay. Yes, I'm really that's sorry. Right. So it's not because of our train connection that you... you it's not, but... Okay. No, but uh, the train connection could be an issue, actually, yes. <laughs> so perhaps you could, uh, just to, to mean to join this conversation, we are going very far now, and um, I have to... to perhaps more topics and then uh, I'll leave you in peace. But you, um, yes, you, I would say that uh, the movement you represent Friday for Future was this uh, wake up call for many politicians huh? about climate emergency, about also another way of, of living and transport. Uh, so being outside, but a consumer of trains, what, what would you ask? To, to people who can listen to you uh, on, uh, on bringing, to bring more people using the train today? Yes, thank you for the question. So I think we heard the first um, measure that's a good possibility um, right before it. So we need an affordable train system. So we need to have a public system that is affordable for everyone, that is cheaper than going by cars, that is cheaper um, then fly actually. And um, this is really important just to have the incentives of the, of the users of the um, users of the trains and all the public services um, to really use it and not use it as an exception, but use it regularly. So this is the first point, and that means we have to invest in it and we really need to want it. This is important because what we see right now is that we kind of want this, but we don't, are not um, strong enough and politicians are not strong enough to really stress this issue and also decide for train and for railway and against cars in many issues. And this is what we need. And this is a decision that, that politicians should take and uh, this is what we need. 
And of course, there are technical issues. So we need to um, build a better railway um, system for the um, small cities, um, for the villages that they don't need the car for the rural areas. Um, this is also really important. We need an, as we also mentioned it in the discussion before, we need a connected, ra uh, connected railway system all in Europe so that we, for example, have one software, one app um, that we can use. Um, as I said, I was in Glasgow. It was a nightmare going there. I know it's not you anymore. <laughs> We did um, not take the same train as Christian Smith because he said it was a perfect journey. You you were on different uh, trains. Yeah, we probably were on different trains, but I needed because there were some issues of extreme weather, and um, then I needed to download three apps, and I just did research for three or four hours just to go there. And I think this is not good actually okay. um, to just go by train so these are some measures we could take uh, to make it just more affordable and more easy for users to use it so you help me because you bring me towards my two last subjects i wanted to tackle and i saw that some questions arrived in the new uh, q and a chat and even here about that so one is the uh, ticketing problem and the um, and the passenger rights more in general? So, after a um, quite long negotiation, we arrived to a new regulation this year. But this uh, new regulation did not make mandatory um, the what is called the through tickets. So, uh, the fact that uh, people can buy one ticket. Uh, covering many companies and if you miss a connection you can for example jump on a following train this is not possible today and in almost all cases companies don't talk each other um, the commissioner then did not propose it as a mandatory so my easy question would be are you thinking of uh, coming back to that um, because uh, until it's not mandatory probably companies will not change that Christian, of course. <laughs> Christian, of course. Well, thank you very much. Um, no, I agree. First of all, on, on, on the, the train to Glasgow, I confess I was traveling with a climate train that was organized very efficiently by ProRail and Eurostar. Um, so uh, I would- Explains. <laughs> that explains. And it's true, there were extreme weather event, events. Um, um, so uh, climate change, stopping delegates from going to the climate change conference how ironic um uh, but then there were also strikes in scottish rail uh, making the journey back complicated so you know rail has some issues uh, that must be dealt with coming to your 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 serious question ticketing and i i would agree that this is a mess uh, this is a mess uh, and the difficulty and time that has to be invested in order to find a train path from point a to point b We've been talking about it for decades, um, and it's not it's not working. Um, let me just uh, point out, because your own investigation, Maria, shows it, the Commission proposed through ticketing in the last uh, uh, discussion on passenger rights. And as your investigation rightly shows, it was supported by Parliament, and it was uh, then uh, not taken up by Council. Uh, so uh, the Commission is certainly aware that this is an issue. It is not enough to have some sort of beautiful platform where you can you can find the connections if you cannot also book them and book them with the rights that goes with a contract as 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 you have in aviation. We are uh, hearing, I would say, a changing tune from the sector that yes, they understand and yes, they will work on it and yes. Um, uh, they are working on uh, um, solutions. Let me stress, this is not at all a technological issue. There is software and middleware, and you can provide the data in open data platforms, and then the systems can uh, work this out. It's possible in all other sectors, and it's certainly possible in rail as well. Uh, and we have the railway agency, and we have our uh, research uh, program, Shift to Rail, working on this. So all the data protocols, it's not the problem. The problem are the commercial interests of uh, the established market players allowing and seeing their interest in giving uh, uh, a place for the other smaller operators 
to be on the market and see their products being marketed on uh, these sales platform. So uh, to answer your question, yes, we are impatient. And if the industry doesn't do this, we will legislate. Um, and we will legislate not just for rail, but for multimodal ticketing as a whole, because it's very important. It's very important that a, 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 um, a, a European citizen can get the connection from a bus to a train station, to an airport and going back uh, again. Um, that makes it a little bit more complicated and I'm not promising a solution for tomorrow. And again, we will be faced with a legislative proposal that will have to gain the support of parliament and council. And as your own investigation shows last time, there were a pushback on that. We will certainly uh, come with a proposal uh, on ticketing uh, next year. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you for this news. Um, I mean, it's also new what I hear that companies are now more sensitive to that because then companies don't talk with their governments because uh, as we, we, we proved uh, at least um, Germany, France and Spain, not to name them, opposed this, uh, this, um, this particular point in the regulation. So they should start talking uh, with their company if uh, from a commercial point of view, there is even an interest to to harmonize this system. I see two hands. I th I guess it's on this topic, um, Tom, and then Tobias, please. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add again an example from um, our experience to this. So um, the issue with uh, multimodal ticketing and, and creating new ticketing platforms um, is twofold. On the one hand, we have to make sure that there is the infrastructure so that people can really use multimodal offers. The reality nowadays is very often we have a bus product out there. There are Flix buses running across Europe and millions of people are using them, but we are very often not allowed to stop with the buses outside of railway stations because local city councils decide that buses do not belong into city centers, which is not understandable, but very often the case or the, uh, the infrastructure simply is lacking. There is no bus stop close to a train stop. That's the first part of it. So we have to solve um, the hard infrastructure. And then on the other hand, what we fear is that with this discussion around building a new common big ticketing platform, we miss the opportunity that we have at hand right now. We already have dominant booking channels for rail. For example, in Deutsche Bahn, it's Bahn.de and their app, DB Navigator, um, which 98% of passengers in Germany that book a ticket online are using. And 99% of rail offering in Germany is on that website. It's Deutsche Bahn, but it's also its competitors in local transport. The only offer that is not listed there is ours, the Flix train offer. And so it happens that, for example, when Deutsche Bahn's trains are fully booked, all that a visitor of that website sees is trains are fully booked, no tickets available. Even though a Flix train would be running there and there are seats available on that train, you can't see them, you can't book them. So what happens to passengers do not choose the train, they take a car instead, they fly. So that is not what we want to achieve. They so take the we, train, the car. For example, yeah. So what we have to do first is to use what we already have at hand, the dominant booking channels instead of investing a lot of resources and a lot of money in making new platforms known, which in the long run will be important, but we have an opportunity at hand which we can use at, at short term and that we need to use to win more people over to rail right now, not in five years, not in 10 years, it's for free, we can do it now. I think your claim has been heard, Tom. Thank you very much. Tobias, you wanted to add something on that? Yes, yes, I wanted to. Um, now I want to uh, respond to Tom as well, but um, maybe maybe to the to the issue before. Um, so I think actually it's pretty important um, to use this data, as also mentioned in this chat, as open data. So if you really want um, really want uh, to have um, competition in the EU, if you really want this, you. You can argue to that if you don't want this, but if you say you want real competition, then you need this data, and then the apps can, um, yeah, the, the apps the apps can fight over the market against each other. But we need this data because what we see right now is that we're 
as Tom also mentioned, that we're having right now just, um, just single use for trains, single use for, I don't know, shared cars, single use for, uh, for buses. And what are states for if they don't say that we need this platform as a basic infrastructure? And of course we can use it for the first, uh, first years uh, of Deutsche Bahn or whatever, that doesn't matter for me, but it is really, really important um, to put all this together, to have a public service, public transport service um, software and to have a public transport service data um, that can be used from, f from every people, from, from anyone uh, in the EU and also from outside the EU. Okay, platform, new platform. John, what do you want to add on that? Two very quick points. First of all, Flixbus are hypocrites. Um, if I want to book a Flix train, yeah, and I book it on one of the railway booking platforms like Trainline, it just directs me through to Flixbus's website. So actually, Deutsche Bahn is providing better data to a third-party railway booking platform than Flixbus is. So Flixbus is not practicing what it preaches in that respect. So um, I'm sorry, they're too big for their boots in that regard. The second point is before we get to ticket booking, you even need to know which trains even run. And we don't actually have a reliable, completely publicly accessible European rail timetable. So if you want to book, for example, regional trains in Spain around Barcelona, Euska train in, um, in the Basque country, trains in many of the Balkan countries, in Greece, if you want low cost TGVs in France, the WeGo product, for example, those trains don't show in the main websites like Deutsche Bahn's timetable search. And that's because those train companies don't put those trains into the database system for European timetables called UIC Merit. So before we even get to ticketing, before we even book the train, we as passengers need to know what trains actually exist. And that data is actually of a poorer quality now than was the case 10 or 15 years ago. And then there's a third problem, which is when we've even got our tickets booked and we actually want to know is our train running on time, the data that we can get about live running is also of a questionable quality. So it, ticketing, I understand, is the main problem, but there is also a problem with timetabling and with live booking. Good. I would like to stop here this part of conversation because otherwise for people out, outside it becomes difficult to follow, but I understand it's very hot and, uh, and there are many thoughts and you should go on also bilaterally talking about that. There is another issue which um, comes up each time we speak about cross-border connections. I would like to bring you another time uh, on that because this is um, what is suffering more. We know that uh, for companies, I think it was your director, Pio, who told us that companies uh, only think national, 95% uh, of their market is national, and, uh, and we can imagine why they don't want to invest in the cross-border connections. We experienced that uh, uh, with our journalist, Paolo, who tried to travel, um, he's not so expert like you, John, who travels all the time, but he did the Lisbon Madrid, uh, where the direct connection does not exist anymore. And now you need to take four trains. It takes 11 hours instead of five hours by car. Um, and so we know also that the Portuguese presidency um, before the summer tried to bring a new principle of uh, public service obligations into the table in the council. And this was just delayed by a big country who thought this was not something that should have been discussed. So I have a question about um, cross-border connection. Don't you think that uh, as it's so difficult to push also private companies to invest in uh, connections which are not so profitable, sometimes it can happen, but it concerns important capitals in Europe, that there should be uh, a green light to subsidize those um, connections. And so public service obligations, subsidies stated. Um, I ask that, of course, to Christian Smith, but I would like also to hear you on that, the others, because for us, we think this is crucial to change the problem of cross-border connections. So. Um, 
what is your opinion on uh, on this principle of PSO? You call it, Mr. Christian Schmidt, please. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Maria. First, I object to the discrimination. Everybody is Tom, Pew, and John, and I'm Mr. Smith. So uh, <laughs> if I, I call for equal treatment. But you are the only one with, with a tie. Huh? Well, it goes right now if that's the problem. <laughs> so, oh, Perfect. I'm Christian, Done. Now. So I'm Christian now. Now you're All right. Christian. All right. Okay. All right. okay, so the first principle should be, um, of course, that um, if a connection is, is commercially viable, then let it go, let it run. Huh? And our job, our first task, should be to reduce the obstacles. It should not be the European taxpayer compensating, subsidizing for our failure of reducing those inherent structural costs of lack of interoperability, national rules, and the railway nationalism or the fragmentation that you have identified in your report. So first order of the day, eliminate those unnecessary costs. Because we have done a study um, uh, um, in preparation for our action plan, and we find many city pairs, many possible cross-border connections who would be commercially viable um, and could also uh, facilitate a shift to rail from aviation, from instance. Um, Sorry if to cut those you, costs ca came down. Ca can I cut you on that, what you well, said? But I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> No, but what are these obstacles that, in your opinion, states should eliminate? For instance, I put you one on the table where I think mm -hmm. also the Commission could do something. Um, eliminating uh, subsidies to the road, is that, is that a way to eliminate obstacles to train? That's not what I meant by the obstacles. When I said <laughs> obstacles, I meant ticketing, path allocation, all the things we've been talking for uh, about for an hour. But you're right, uh, level playing field is also certainly part of getting commercially viable because you are competing, right? So there must be a level playing field. It's for that reason that the commission has put forward the Fit for 55 package, which will introduce road pricing, which will introduce uh, uh, extension of emission trading schemes to road, and it will also introduce uh, taxation of kerosene for aviation. And I pray the parliament and the council will take this up quickly, because if we're serious about uh, railways, we should be serious about the level playing field. But your question was, if we fail to do all that, should we then subsidize with PSOs? Well, we already can. It's in the legislation um, that if the market can't deliver and society wants to have a connection, um, which is perfect. I come from a small rural area in Denmark. Right? Um, when I came back down to Europe 30 years ago, I took a night train that doesn't exist today. I would love to see that come back. I would love to see it being commercially viable it can't be because uh, track access charges in Germany are too high and therefore the attempt to bring it back has failed. So yes, there could be a PSO to do that, uh, but the important principle only if the market has failed. What is now difficult for that to uh, happen is that you are talking about national authorities in various member states having to communicate and agree that this is a socially important objective. Uh, hybrid uh, services also where, for instance, in Austria, there are subsidies, then you go into Germany, there are not subsidies, and then you end up in, in Belgium where there are subsidies. It's very complicated, and that's one of the reasons it doesn't work. The Commission, as part of the action plan we will uh, announce next uh, month, will also pick up this issue uh, because we see a need for greater and clearer guidance on how to do these PSOs on cross-border connections when several countries are involved. So agree entirely, this is an issue, but please keep in mind the principle, if the market can, can deliver, the taxpayer shouldn't pay for it and the level playing field. Uh, these are important principles. Thank you very much. We learn a lot of things about what will happen soon. We hope it will happen soon. Um, um, Tom, I see again your hand. Then I, I saw John uh, with his uh, head saying no many times. So I will, I will ask you if you agree uh, with that. And then we go towards the end. So please, Tom, not too long. No. What would you like to, to add to that? Thank you. I'll uh, try to stay brief. So uh, first of all, I fully agree with Christian. Um, we really have to make sure not to introduce unnecessary PSOs where we could achieve way more if we would remove obstacles. So for example, lower track access charges, um, for example, set up a fund so that also private operators can invest into rolling stock um, to operate services. 
um, reduce the technical barriers. Yes, it is not so sexy. And yes, you cannot declare within two years that you will have a new service and uh, you can cut the ribbon, but this will solve the issues in the long term. The question is, do you give the market a painkiller, which will get more and more and more expensive over time? And if you stop giving it, the market fails, or do you solve the underlying issues? So for us, it is very, very relevant that we first now speak about removing the remaining obstacles. And then if we really want to award PSOs, we have to think about how can we protect actually the open access services? Because what we have at the moment is the pretty interesting situations that PSO services are protected from competition. There's an economic equilibrium test. So if you want to start a service that competes with a PSO, then you have to prove that you don't harm this PSO too much. But there's no such thing the other way around. So governments, and they actually already did together with the incumbents, they awarded PSO services where there were perfectly functioning open access services. And there, we don't understand why you would award a PSO because taxpayers' money is a scarce resource. And this brings me to the last point. The question is, what do you want to subsidize? Do you want to subsidize a luxury night train with sleeper cars where maybe seven to 10 people are sleeping in? And with that, you get maybe seven to 10 people out of a business class of a flight. Or do you want to lower track access charges and reduce fees overall for the market to win trains, for example, like FlixTrain or other low cost services that get people out of the Ryanair planes and make the entire plane empty and not just the business class? So that's the question. Um, we have to answer first before we think about, okay, we need more PSOs and we need to more, uh, subsidize the system more um, with exclusive subsidies just for single players. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, John, uh, what do we have to subsidize? Yeah, I, I agree with largely with the points that both Christian and, and Tom uh, have, have made there. Um, there's this, this rhetoric that's caught on as a result of the failure of the, the Swedish agency Trafik Berket to manage to procure a PSO supported night train from Malmö through Denmark, through Germany and through to Belgium. The idea that the absence of a PSO is the reason why that, that procurement failed. I disagree with that basis. And that's the reason why I am working on this campaign Trains for Europe, which is basically trying to solve the night train rolling stock problem. Part of the difficulty is why you can't scale up long distance services like that is because no railway companies have any suitable trains that they could run. And if you are a small operator that would like to try to run a service like that, like the Swedish operator Snell Target, for example, or maybe the Czech operator Regiojet, your access to being able to buy those carriages is very limited. While the companies that would have the financial clout to do so if they wanted to, like Deutsche Bahn, for example, have stepped out of that market and have no intention of re-entering the market. So you have a situation that the companies that could don't want to, and the companies that want to can't, essentially. And so that's where I would start, is to try to unlock that point. Now, what you have to also do is achieve economies of scale, which is then also very difficult for new entrants into the, the railway market. If you order 20 new night train carriages, your cost per carriage is high. If you order 200 or 500 new night train carriages, your cost per unit is low. And so that's therefore the focus of my work to dealing with cross-border, particularly night trains in Europe, is essentially to say, you have to start with the absence of the trains themselves, make a order, or the EU should help facilitate the order of a new pool of carriages to see which operators could provide those services. And if then at the very end of the day, you ultimately conclude you're not getting the services that you want, then perhaps you come to public service obligations. But that is definitely not for solving this problem where you should start. Thank you very much. This brings me to my last question, which I ask to all of you. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a painful question again for the Commission, I'm sorry, uh, but it's, it's important to understand what, uh, where are our priorities now in the coming, let's say, 10 years. Um, so we have, visited, we have been visiting many of the EU corridors, and we know that uh, there are problems in many of them because uh, the infrastructure is uh, going on, 
where there are strong infrastructure, but slowly. But the problem is also with all the connections with this infrastructure. Um, and it's not sure that member states uh, want to invest in these uh, corridors, uh, because as we said, as also the, the agency PO told us, um, they think um, it's much more important to invest in a uh, national um, market. So my, my naive question is, uh, I mean, sometimes the uh, politicians change the poli policies and uh, we saw it with the, with the fossil energies where the commission slowly, uh, in my, our opinion, a bit too slowly, is not financing gas uh, fossil uh, investments uh, anymore. Um, I put it like that, as a, if it was my son to ask that. But wouldn't it be better today to move this money investing in corridors towards capitals, connections, towards night trains, towards this climate emergency, where people demand to have more and better trains, and they probably don't ask to use all these corridors, as also the court of uh, auditors told us that in some of them, there is even not a, a market study. Um, who wants to start? The future of corridors. <laughs> I don't want to call Christian the first, but I mean, if you want to, to start, or Pio perhaps. Ale Pio, I'm sorry if I did not involve you too much. I don't know. Uh, I think corridors. Uh, corridors. I, think I, I will let I will let the commission speak. But I mean, corridors are not only uh, I can say big tunnels or incredible uh, I can say uh, civil words that that are missing. In some cases, yes, there is a, a kind of a missing link that can really make uh, an end-to-end -end connection which is valuable and as market functional. And then maybe we should be careful not to take. I can say under the spotlight only this this missing link and all the difficulties. I mean, you mentioned the Brenner Tunnel, and clearly this is I mean it will be the longest tunnel in the world. So it's not it's not something that I mean it is is not something easy to 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 realize, and it can be understandable if they have delays. But I think that if they finish the the tunnel as it was. I can say 50 or 100 years ago when we did similar works uh, for connecting Europe with different, uh, I can say in the age maybe of the steam locomotive, they, they are still there. We are still using them. I mean, those investments are really But it's not long sure term. it will be used. To, sorry to yeah, cut you. It's not I, used I think, to be used. I think, I think in some cases, those missing links will really make sure that uh, something different will, will change. It's not just uh, the car. I mean, it's the offer that will create the the demand is not only the current demand that is needed to, to justify uh, a, a tunnel or another important uh, work that will be there for for maybe centuries in uh, in the future. So I, I'm not so. I mean, I understand what you say about the money, and uh, we always should make sure that we make the better use. But um, I think railways are not something on which you can change priorities in, in a matter of years. I think that we have to take the, the long view on that. And definitely, yes, we need the market studies and the, 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 economy, the economic studies for that. But um, I'm, I'm positive that the investment in the railways in the end will be, will be useful. Good. Christian? Thanks a lot, Maria. Um, well, uh, big infrastructure projects, uh, the Brenner, I think uh, we make no excuses for the hundreds and millions of euros and billions putting, put into that. 50% uh, of transalpine uh, transport goes uh, through the Brenner, and today 70% of that is by road. Um, uh, the, the only way to switch that proportion is uh, long term with the tunnel that we are building. It is a a pan-European priority that is essential for reaching our Green Deal uh, objectives. It's unfortunate it's, take, it's taking so long, uh, but unfortunately that's not rare for these big infrastructure projects. I would say for the EU funding um, uh, in, in, in general, uh, we have this called the, the, the Connecting Europe facility. 70%, um, more than 70% of what is spent with EU funding is on, um, on rail. Uh, in the transport area. So uh, certainly we are putting our money where our mouth is. Um, and it is targeted very carefully at the gaps uh, in the cross-border connections where you are right. Member states tend not to prioritize because let's face it, the revenue, their turnover, 
is made on the domestic markets and they tend not to prioritize those gaps at the borders. This is why we have the Connecting uh, Europe facility uh, to address that. Uh, uh, and again, next month, we will come out with the new maps, uh, the new 10 uh, guidelines that will show where the coming pot of billions will be invested. Um, and you will see, you don't like corridors, I understand, but, but you may like the new concept of European transport corridors where you have high speed lines on the, on the map. You have uh, all these uh, corridors integrated into target investments. And we will use those investments also to address all the other things we've been talking about for an hour. EU member states are not going to get money from the European Commission if it's not also implementing all the standard uh, standardization, the harmonization, the role of ERTMS, digitalization, etc. So it's a stick that we have. As always, it would be better if it was bigger. Uh, but uh, um, we are addressing those those gaps, um, and uh, and corridors are um, a useful concept uh, for doing so. Thanks. Good. I received many messages uh, from uh, my direction that we are uh, getting very late. So I think we can close this here. Um, we we are looking forward to these new Commission proposals. Um, we, I, I, I don't, don't like corridors, Christian. I would like only now um, capitals, European capitals to be better connected uh, by train. And I think uh, this is the wish of uh, all of us. Uh, and we, if it can be done together with the corridors, welcome. Uh, I thank all of you. It was a very rich discussion. Uh, sometimes it's complicated for people who are not used to that. This also shows the complexity of the, of the railway system. Um, but um, I mean, uh, hopefully, Tobias, uh, there is a new political um, behavior now which will change minds. Um, and so, um, thank you to all of you and uh, have a nice evening. And for those who did not receive an answer, I apologize. Um, you can write to us also uh, in our website, it's mail at investigate trade union Europe. Dot eu and uh, we will ask to all uh, we will answer to all uh, your questions so thank you very much bye bye <laughs>